Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Um, this lecture is continuation of uh, theory of probabilities. Um, we will devote some time talking about normal distributions. Um, this lecture is a part of advanced uh, mathematics course for teenagers, which is presented on unizor.com website, and that's where I suggest you to um, to watch this lecture from, um, because the website contains notes which are basically like a textbook for you, um, so it's very um, beneficial for you to basically work with both the video presentation and the text. Now, um, back to probability theory. Um, last lecture was about normal distribution and um, I told you that um, I have a little problem describing the details of normal distribution because on one hand this is well arguably the most important probabilities distribution in the theory of probabilities and on another hand it's a continuous distribution and uh, the apparatus, the mathematical apparatus is basically calculus and relatively advanced calculus which I don't want actually to uh, to touch right now for this course. Um, it's basically belo it belongs to higher education, to universities, etc. So I'm trying to present the normal distribution of probabilities in a qualitative um, uh, uh, light, uh, basically through examples, maybe and some maybe more detailed explanations, without rigorous mathematical derivation of certain formulas. So the last lecture was a definition of what normal distribution is about and again I told you this is probably the most important distribution because uh, and that's very interesting because well I can say because of the central limit theorem so there is a central limit theorem which is very very important in theory of probabilities which basically states that if you will mix together many different random variables their sum behaves as a normal distribution, basically, normal variable. More precisely, we are talking about averaging of certain number of, of not certain number of random variables. Um, then there are certain conditions when this theorem is actually true. A very simple and sufficient condition for uh, the central limit theorem is if we are averaging um, n identically distributed independent variables we are averaging them and the new random variable behaves more or less approximately and there are certain mathematical criteria obviously of my um, of this approximation, so to speak, uh, behaves more or less like a, nor like a normal uh, random variable. The random variable with normal distribution of probabilities. So, this is a sufficient condition. So, all of them are identically distributed and independent variables. And the theorem states that their average is as close to um, normal uh, distributed uh, random variable as possible whenever the n increases to infinity. Well, this is a statement and I couldn't really prove it because as I was saying uh, the mathematical apparatus goes beyond the scope of this particular course. However, I would like to illustrate it. So, what I'm going to do right now is I would like to illustrate this central limit theorem in one particular case. Um, the case which I would like to consider is if all our random variables are very very simple, well maybe, well, maybe the simplest random variables, results of Bernoulli experiment with the probability of success and the failure obviously the same. So, this is 
uh, our random variable. So uh, C i t is equal to zero with probability equal to one half and it's equal to one with probability equal to one half. Now, in practical terms, let's say you're flipping the coin, the probability of heads and tails is one half, um, so you um, are adding together uh, all your, let's say you associate uh, zero with tail and one with heads. So you're adding together basically all your uh, results and that means you, you're adding one for each head. You're averaging divided by the number of experiments you have conducted, the number of flips which you made, and this is your new random variable eta. And then you are basically experimenting either once or twice or a hundred times in a row and the more times you experiment um, let's say you experiment with million coins right in one shot you flip the million coins and you have the, the result then you flip them another time and you have the result you add all the uh, heads and that's th that's the result that you have the number so the number for a million coins will be in the range of from zero when all million coins are on the tail or a million when all of them are heads. Now both extremes are very very rare probabilities. Um, now the uh, something like half a million for this particular sum can occur much more frequently because it doesn't require a particular result on every uh, experiment. For instance, the first half of the experiments can be tail and the second half can be heads or vice versa. Or every second should be head and every another second, every odd and, and even can be correspondingly tails and, and, and heads. And in all these cases the result will be half a million, right? Because you will have exactly half a million heads and half a million, million uh, tails. And there are many other variations, obviously. And the more combinations you have to basically get that half a million, the greater the probability of that half a million will be. So I can say that the distribution of probability is some kind of a graph which has values from zero to a million with different probabilities. And that's what I'm going to draw right now for the first few cases. And I will show that this graph actually more and more resembles the bell curve, which is the characteristic property of normal uh, random variable. So that's my purpose for today. Right, let's do it. Now, what about graphical representation? Graphical representation will be very simple. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Now, so my variable eta, which is equal to sum of um, Bernoulli experiments and Bernoulli experiments um, divided by n. So let's consider n is equal to 1. So what are the values of my eta? Well, in this case, eta is c1 divided by 1, so it's c1. And the values are 0 and 1, the probabilities are 1 half and 1 half, right? So the graphical representation will be like this. So this is 1 half. And the graph will be actually, I don't really need this, it would be dotted line, okay? So for the probability, uh, for the value of 0, the probability will, will be one half. For, for the value of one, the probability would be also one half. And there are no other values this particular variable can take. It's only either zero or one. And I have agreed um, before to graphically represent it as this type of combination of rectangles, which uh, have one length, one unit as a, as a base, and the 
probability as, as a height. All right, so that's simple. Great. Let's move on. n is equal to 2. So my n is equal to c1 plus c2 divided by 2, where c1 and c2 are either 0 or 1 with probability 1 half. So what, what can we have here as, as for values? Well, the values are, if both of them are equal to 0, then the value would be 0, right? And the probability of this is 0 and 0. So two independent variables, and I'm asking for the probability of one being equal to 0, which is 1 half, and another being equal to 0, which is also 1 half, and I need simultaneous. It's two different coins simultaneously going, um, uh, falling on tails, right? So it's 1 half times 1 half, because we need the, uh, the event, which is a combination of two elementary events which are independent of each other so the probabilities are multiplying. So it's one half by one half. So it's one quarter. Then next value is one. One can be either when the first is equal to one and the second is equal to zero or the first is equal to zero and the second is equal to one. So we have two different variations. We have one zero or zero one. The probability of this is one-half times one-half, one-quarter. Probability of this is equal to one-quarter. One-half of this times one-half of this. So together, when the sum is equal to one, I have two elementary events which are supposed to be summed up, and the probability will be one-half plus one-quarter one plus one-quarter. It will be two-quarters, right? So. Again, it's not this, it's this. So this is a two quarters. And finally, my value can be equal to, um, to two. I'm talking about sum, forget about dividing by two. So my uh, value can be equal to two uh, when both of them are equal to one. So it's one half for the one and, uh, and one half for another, so it's again one quarter. So that would be this value. That's for two. Now, the values are divided by two actually, which means that the whole graph should be squeezed by, 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 by the factor of two. But it doesn't really change the, the shape of the graph. That's why I decided just to, to go with the sum, C1 plus C2 rather than C1 plus C3 divided by 2. But uh, I would like to illustrate that the, uh, the shape is something like this already. Now, it doesn't really resemble the bell curve, bell curve yet, but you know, well, you already see that there is something like uh, higher middle and, and lower um, both ends, right? But let's continue on and let's increase the number of experiments. Let's go to n is equal to 3. Now, before I go any further, let me remind you that um, it's very easy to calculate the formula for eta is equal to k, where eta is equal to c1 plus c2 plus etc. plus cn. Now, if these are Bernoulli experiments with values of 0 and 1, with certain probabilities uh, certain probabilities P and 1 minus P, which is Q. Now, um, you should remember that to, uh, to find the value, uh, the probability of the value of eta to be equal to k, you basically have to understand that there are k ones among them and other n minus k are zeros, right? But that can be in any uh, kind of a, a sequence. So basically it's 
uh, number of um, uh, combinations from n by k that gives me that gives you certain concrete distribution of ones among all these times you have ones uh, uh, k times so the probability should be p to the case uh, degree and uh, q should be to the n minus k the power n minus k so that's the formula which I have already derived when I was talking about Bernoulli um, experiments so I can use it actually in this particular case um, uh, without more detailed uh, description of different combinations etc I will do it one more time for n is equal to 3 and then I will use the formula for 4, 5 and 6 and whatever And again, on this graph, I will just use integer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I will not divide by numerator, because whenever you divide by numerator, the whole graph would be um, from 0 to, to, to 1, basically, right? Um, so it will look the same, but it will be more difficult to, to view it in, in, in the details. All right, so let's uh, consider the next case, n is equal to 3. And we will see if our graph would be a little bit more uh, bell type okay n is equal to 3 so let's consider c1 plus c2 plus c3 so again what kind of different values my variable eta um, can get well it's obviously maximum is 3 when all 3 are 1 and minimum is zero when all three are zero, right? And anything in between. So from zero to three, zero, one, two, and three. So zero. How can we can? How can we get zero? Well, zero we can get only in one way. When this and this and this are equal to zero, the probability of each one is equal to zero is one half. But we need all three of them, so we have to multiply one half times one half times one half. So one over eight. Now, when I'm talking about 1, it means only one of them is equal to 1, and two others are zeros, right? It can be either this one, or this one, or this one. So it's three different combinations. And for each combination, the probability is 1 half. So it's 3 eighths, right? So it's 3 times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. So it's either 0, uh, zero 1, or 0, 1, 0, or 1, 0, 0. These three combinations are delivering the result equal to 1. Next is the value of 2. Now, when can we get 2? When we have two ones and one zero. So 0 can be either here or here or here and the other two are ones, right? So again, we have three different combinations. So again, the probability is this. And finally, uh, the value of three, it can get only in one case when all three of them are equal to one. So it's one half times one half times one half, probability is one eighth. Now, graphically, it would be one-eighths, three-eighths, again three-eighths, and one. Okay. Uh, I don't think this looks more like a bell curve than the previous case, but you understand that right now we are um, spreading the, the whole curve, which means that when, whenever we will squeeze it by the factor of 3 right now to be only with it from 0 to 1, we will get actually a curvier, so to speak, bell. Let me add one more. n is equal to 4. Okay, and now I will look I will actually use this formula, C n k times 
Now, p to the power of k and q to the power n minus k. But in our case, we have p and q are equal to one half. So this is one half and this is one half. So, which means we can add the exponents and we will have one half to the nth degree. Right? Because p and q are both one half. So, in our case, n is equal to 4, and I'm looking for value of eta equal to 0. Okay, now n is equal to 4, which means in the uh, denominator I have 16. Now, um, the number of uh, 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 number c of uh, n, n by k. Uh, is obviously 1, so that's 1 sixteenths. Okay, number of cases, number of combinations from n by 1, from 4 by 1 actually, well, it's 4, right? I hope everybody remembers this formula. So this is 4 sixteenths. Next is 2. Um, combinations from 4 by 2. This is 4, 2, and 2. Uh, 24, so it's 6, right? 6 sixteenths. Um, probability of 8 is equal to 3. That's uh, same as 1, that's 4 sixteenths. And probability of 8 equal to 4 is, all well, 4 should be equal to 1, it's 1 sixteenths. All right, now let's draw the graph. So now I have numbers from 0 to 4. Well, 5 is because the, the rectangle goes this way. So for 1, I have 1 sixteenths. For, uh, for 0, I have 1 sixteenths. For 1, I have 4 sixteenths. So it's like this. For 2, I have 6 sixteenths. So it's something like this. Then 4 sixteenths again and 1 sixteenths again. Okay, we have more rectangles, but together, you see, they are again uh, re resemble this um, bell curve a little bit better than the previous case. So every time I'm adding the number of um, variables here, my uh, graph resembles in more and more details this bell curve which I was talking about. Next, n is equal to 5. I'm challenging your patience just to demonstrate how closely it comes to um, normal distribution. So, um, 5. So, what do we have? We have values from 0 to 5. And um, my denominator would be 132. 2 to the 5th degree, right? And I will have 6 here. So, for the value of 0, I will have 132 for the probability. For the probability of 1, I have 532. For the probability of 2, I have 1032. Probability of 3 is equal to 1032. And the probability of 4 is equal to 532 and the probability of 5 is equal to 1. 
So one, five, ten, thirty second. So I will have something like this, then like this, then like this. then like this, then like this, and like this. Okay, I have more rectangles, so whenever I will average it, which means divide by 5, they will also be on the same um, segment from 0 to 1, but more fine distribution, and it will be uh, more um, more closely, uh, it's it's closer resem closer resemblance to a, to a bell shape. Yeah. Okay, and the last one, just to try your patient patience, is n is equal to six, and that would be my end example. N is equal to six. So I have values of the sum from 0 to 6, right? So all the values in this, uh, all the integer values um, in this interval are possible. Now, the probability of equal of this uh, equal to 0 is um, 1 over 2 to the 6th degree, which is 1 64th. Probability to take the value of 1 would be 6 64th. Probability to take the value of 2, so it's uh, combinations from 6 to by, by 2, it's 6 times 5 divided by 2, it's 15, 64. Probability to have its the value of e equal to 3, which means we have 3 ones and, uh, and 3 zeros. Um, so 6 from 6, 6 factorial divided by Three factorial and divided by three factorial. This is um, uh, twenty, right? Yes. Yes. Um, 4 is equal to same as 2 because it's symmetrical 15 64 5 is 6 64 and 6 is 1 64 all right as far as the graph is concerned the distribution of probabilities now i didn't use this term um, this distribution of probabilities which i am describing right now Sometimes it's called the density of probabilities, but it's more applicable to continuous um, random variables. That's why I'm trying to avoid this term right now. So I'm calling it distribution of probabilities among integer numbers, basically. So it looks like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, I will do it approximately. So this is 1 64. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So once then I have 6, then I have 15, then I have 20, then I have 15 again, and 6 again, and 1 again. So, again, the more uh, random variables we are averaging, the more bell-like shape it becomes. And if we will introduce some kind of a difference between the real bell shape, bell shape and, and this um, set of rectangles, basically, the difference being probably something like an area of these little thing whenever I will squeeze it to the segment from 0 to 1 when I'm averaging divide by n right so 
if I will evaluate this difference between my uh, graphical representation of this distribution of probabilities and the real Bell curve, it will be going to zero basically as n increases to infinity. And that's, that's basically the purpose um, of, of the central limit theorem. The more and more the average of uh, the sum of random variables um, resemble the, uh, the bell curve, the, the normal distribution of probabilities. Now, just think about this for a second. I took something which is completely unrelated to normal distribution. I, I took the Bernoulli random variables. They just take two values, zero and one. But then I start adding them together, mixing them together. And uh, as a result, um, uh, on average, I am getting closer and closer to the normal distribution. Now, um, I might or might not, I'm not sure, illustrate it in some other distributions, like geometric, for instance, distribution and some others, and it will be exactly the same thing. And, and the meaning of the central limit theorem of, the, of uh, the theory of probabilities is that no matter what kind of initial distribution of probabilities you're, you're, you're having, not, no matter what kind of a random variable you start with, if you will sufficiently mix them together, you will add them together, you will eventually add up them to a new, nor new almost normally distributed random variable. And that's why the normal distribution plays such an important role um, in the theory of probabilities and in statistics. Especially in statistics, but w w when you are uh, making certain experiments on, on, on drugs or, or errors recording or, or something like this, you are basically mixing together many different factors. Each factor, you don't even know what kind of distribution each factor has, but sufficiently mixed together, maybe from different people, maybe from different experiments, from different time frames, etc. If you are mixing them together, you can count on the result, on averaging um, the result of this will be close to normal because it's very important for um, scientists to find out the distribution of probabilities of random variables and if they are mixing these random variables together they don't have to guess all they need to know is basically that this is almost normal and any normal distribution is characterized by only two parameters the uh, mean, the, the uh, expect, uh, expected value, expectation, and the variance. Now, we can statistically evaluate these two uh, parameters, and that gives you the, uh, the, the distribution, the normal distribution with these two parameters. And from there, you can find out what's the probability of my uh, new random variable to be in this particular interval or in that particular interval, whether it's more or less concentrated around your mean or it's significantly spread around, um, etc. That actually concludes my today's lecture, which is supposed to illustrate that mixing together r different random variables under certain conditions results in, um, in the random variable which more and more resembles the the uh, the normal variable normal random variable if the number of initial random variables which we are mixing is increasing to infinity uh, i do suggest you to read the notes to this lecture on unisor.com uh, and basically that's it for today thank you very much and good luck